Statistics, central limit theorem, all possible samples, example. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're current. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one, because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because, apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. In the OneNote presentation section, 1920 Central Limit Theorem, All Possible Samples Example tab, looking at the concept of the Central Limit Theorem, keeping in mind how we might be able to apply that concept to a normal practical application within statistics, where we are trying to find information about a large population. We cannot test every item within that population. Therefore, we would like to be able to take a sample of that population, test the sample, get the findings from that sample, hoping that we can then apply those findings to the larger population in some way, shape, or form. One of the things that we would like to be able to do is use that nice bell-shaped curve because we know a lot about the bell-shaped curve and because we can define it simply with basically two numbers, one being the middle point, that being the mean or the average, the other being the spread, the standard deviation. Now, one of the problems, of course, will be that all of our data might not have a bell-shaped type distribution. Some types of data tend towards a bell-shaped type of distribution, such as if you're looking at the average heights of people or the average length of like a worm or something like that, or you're looking at the errors of approximations if you're trying to find a star in the sky or something like that. But many types of distributions do not have a natural uh, bell-shaped curve that might be skewed to the left. It might be skewed to the right. It might have a uniform type distribution, like if you were to roll a dice and look at the likelihood for the numbers to be coming up on the rolling of the dice. You have an equal likelihood for the one through six items. However, if we took the population and then we thought about all possible combinations of the samples and took the mean of all possible combinations, that number might tend towards more of a bell-shaped curve according to the central limit theorem, even though the population itself does not. That's gonna be one of the core concepts that we want to basically be keeping in mind. Now, when we think about the mean or center point of a population, that's pretty straightforward. So whether we're talking about the population or the sample or the center point or the mean of the means of all possible uh, combinations of samples, all of those will hopefully tend towards that same center point. It's the standard deviation, the spread that becomes more confusing because then we have the standard deviation of the population. We have the standard deviation of a sample but that's not really what we're looking for oftentimes when we're trying to apply the central limit theorem. We're looking for the standard deviation of all possible combinations of samples, which we will typically derive with a formula. But here, we want to get an intuitive sense as to why we're going to be applying the formula. And if we don't have it, and so here's going to be the actual formula that we're going to be looking at. It looks a little bit intimidating, but the second bit of the formula usually we can disregard and just look at this first bit of the formula. So when we're looking at this number, we're not looking at the standard deviation of the population, not the standard deviation of the sample, the standard deviation of we're imagining all possible combinations of samples, which we'll describe more in a second. And we're taking the standard deviation of the population if it were known. If it wasn't, we might have to estimate it with the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of little n, which is going to stand for us to be the sample size. 
So that's going to be the, the general formula. Now, if we just apply this formula and we have no kind of intuition as to how it came about, then it's going to be a little bit more confusing when we have variations uh, uh, to what's going to happen in the future. So we want to get an intuitive understanding of what's going on here. And that's what we're going to look up now. Now, this is going to be our actual population. We only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items within the population. Normally, you're going to have much more items within a population. But for our purposes here, we want to look at all possible combinations of a sample. So we're imagining that we can't get all seven items and we have to take a sample of this. And we're going to have a sample size of just three. So we're going to pick three randomly of the seven and that's what we're going to be imagining that we're going to use to determine something about the sample of three to apply to the larger population of seven. So just some characteristics of this population. The size is uh, seven here. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the mean of the population is 299, which we can basically get with a mean formula, but we can actually just calculate it pretty easily here. 195 plus the 260 plus the 220 plus the 320 plus the 308 plus the 412 plus the 380 divided by seven is the 29928. Okay. And in Excel, we can calculate that with an average function. And then we have then the standard deviation. This is the entire population. So we're using the standard deviation of P, the population, in order to get that. That measures the spread. But remember that that spread is not necessarily bell-shaped. That's the thing. Uh, so that gives us the spread of the population, which is different than what the formula is going to give us over here, which is going to be the, the, the standard deviation in essence as though we had all combinations of sample size in our case sample size we're going to imagine of three from the population of seven and then we have the possible samples of three you can do this with a combined formula so if we were to look at all different combinations of three we have 35 different combinations this gets a little bit tricky as well because when you're thinking about different combinations, you get to a question as to, well, what if I got a sample of three that was A, B, C, and then I got another sample of three that was B, A, C? Well, and so the question is, are those two different samples, combinations, or are they the same? For our purposes here, they're basically going to be the same. We've got the same three numbers. I'm not really caring if the order was A, B, C, or B, uh, AC, right, in terms of the sample of, of three. It's those three items that, that uh, we got. The standard deviation X bar without uh, every possible X bar. So this is going to be the formula that's going to be approximating what we're basically going to do longhand this way. So we're going to say all combinations. Let's imagine that we we get all combinations of these seven numbers. So we have these seven numbers. We're trying to do all combinations. Now it's tedious to do this. We'll do this in Excel if you want to kind of list it out. But one way you can think about it is I could say, here's all the A's. And then I'm going to, if, if this is an A, then I'm going to list the B's for all scenarios here. So A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, and then A, B, and then it starts at the C down. So it's, here's all the different ones. And then I'm going to start from A to the next one is C. So here's A, C, A, C, 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 and then D, E, F, and G. And then you've got the A and the D, 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 D. And then you've got D, E, F, G. And then you've got the A, E's, and there's only E, F, G. And then you've got the A, F, G. And then it goes to the B's. The next one after the B is a C. So here's all the C's, da, 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 and then to the D's. And then you've got the B uh, to the D. B's and D's, then it starts with an E, goes down, and then the B to the E, and then the F's, da, 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 and so on and so forth. And if we count all of those, we get it to 35. That gives us a check. This is just a count function that's showing us that we got 35 combinations, which lets us know, okay, that looks like all combinations. So the point is, we've got all combinations of our population seven, given a sample size of three, and that's what we've listed out here. So now we're going to say, all right, now I'm just going to pull in all of the numbers 
and we're doing this with a lookup function in Excel if you wanted to work this out with Excel. All it's saying is saying, look up in, in the, the, the array over here, look up over here, these values and return to me an A, what's next to the A, which in this case was the 195 and then return to me the B. So that'll give me the 260 and then return to me the C, which will give me the 220. So 195, 260, 220. So these are just the numbers that are co coinciding to our calculations over here, giving us the numerical value based on uh, these items. So we're gonna say, all right, there are those items. And then now we're taking the mean of each sample. So we took samples of three and we're taking the average or mean of each sample. So 195 plus 260 plus 220. Now remember the general idea here would be in practice, if we had a population that we didn't know, but we only had a sample of three, the mean of the population, you can see is 299. The mean of the sample is that divided by three, we got 225. It should tend towards the mean of the sample should still tend towards the mean of the population. So that's gonna be the center, the center point. We're gonna do that for all combos here. So if we took the mean of all combos, the mean of this one would of course just be the 195 plus the 260 plus the 320 divided by three. And that's that one. And the mean of this one is just gonna be the 190, oh, what in the world? Let's go Z, do, do. okay, let's do this one. This is just the 195 plus 260 plus the 380 over three and uh, so so on and so forth. That one, what I didn't get that one right. Let's just try this one, get this one right. 195 plus 260 plus the 412 divided by three. So there it is and so on and so forth. All right, and then, so those are all the means of all possible combinations. So then, and the probability of each of these coming up, remember that randomness, of course, is gonna be a factor. So if I was to randomly choose three out, out of the seven, then we have a, a probability of about 2.86 uh, of any of the combinations to be coming up because we have combinations of one over how many combinations did we have 35 so it's 35 combinations one over 35 so about 2.86 because randomness is, is of course a factor in our sampling size so we don't get the biases of the samples and so on and so forth so if i look at this the mean of all the means so now i'm looking at all of these numbers which are now the means of sample size three and the means of those means are 299. Now that should be uh, basically uh, 299.87 because we had all possible combinations. That number is exactly this number. Now in practice, of course, we won't have all possible combinations. We will probably be taking one sample or we, if we take multiple samples, we're not gonna take every possible sample because that what would be, we already have the population data, but this is giving us the concept that if I was to take every possible mean, then it's gonna give us actually the exact number of the population. So the mean of all the means is exactly equal to the mean uh, of, of the population. The means of all the means of sample size three, in this case, because that's what we chose for the sample size. We could have chosen another sample size, but three is small enough that we can put all combinations down. So that's that. So the mean of the population, the mean of a sample, and the mean of all the means are all gonna hopefully tend towards that middle point. And if we had the mean of all the means, it would tend towards the mean, uh, the mean of, it would be exactly the mean of the, of the population. So we don't need a special formula for calculating the mean, in other words, because the middle point is what it is. If we take one sample, we're gonna approximate that middle point with the average of the sample. But I can't take the standard deviation of just three numbers, which is the sample, to give me, the, to give me the, the standard deviation that I'm looking for. I'm looking for the standard deviation of all of these numbers 
which is the thing that's going to tend towards a bell-shaped curve. So if I took the standard deviation of one sample, it might give me something that tends towards the standard deviation of the population. But unlike with the mean, that's not what we're looking for if we're trying to graph the bell-shaped curve according to the central limit theorem, because what I'm looking for is the means of all possible means of whatever sample size we chose, which in this case was three. So the means of these are not going to be the same as the, as the as the mean as the standard deviation. I'm sorry, the standard deviation of these will not be the same as the standard deviation of the population. In this case, it came out to 34.93. Now, normally we would use standard deviation dot s, not p, because we wouldn't have all possible combinations of means. But in this case, for this example, we have all combinations. That's why we're using the standard deviation of P because we, we have literally every combination in there. But in any case, that gives us the 3493, which is a lot lower than the, the standard deviation of the population, 7409. This number does give us a measure of spread, uh, but again, it's not necessarily a bell-shaped spread, whereas these numbers, again, are likely to tend towards the bell-shaped spread and therefore this standard deviation and mean give us all the information we basically need to make basically a bell a bell shaped curve of that of that data that's going to be the general idea now because this number changes in a way that is predictable even though in practice we're not going to have all separate combinations of whatever sample size we're not going to have that but because they've studied the relationship of what happens to the standard deviation if we were to have all sample size, they have that's how they've derived this formula. So we're trying to get confidence about this formula. They, they're, they're confident that if I know the standard deviation of the population and divide it by the square root of the sample, in this case, three out of the seven, that, that we can get a standard deviation of the what we can call X bar of all the means of all combinations, the average of all combinations of three, with this formula. However, sometimes you might need the correction factor only usually if this n, which is the population, is somewhat is not that large. So usually it's fairly large, your population, and therefore you don't usually need this correction factor. But if it's small, you might need this correction factor as it is in our case, because we only have a population of seven, because we're using a small population so that we can do this so we can calculate every possible mean. All right. So that's the idea. So we've kind of derived this number longhand or with with the full example, but that's what the formula would be giving us uh, kind of in practice is the general idea. Okay, so then if we took random numbers, let's take a random sample now. We, we can derive our random sample a couple ways in Excel. We can take all of these numbers and we can put like a random number generation column next to it and then randomly shuffle these numbers to get us to 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 then give us a random array of numbers from the population of seven that we can then pick three from right another way we can do a random generation is with an index function so i could then say i'm going to do an index function which would look like this of our actual population population range and then say i want you to give me random numbers but I want you to give me, these are the rows, rows one through seven, pick randomly rows one through seven. That's how I got these. And then we did an X lookup to give us the related numbers to those letters. And then and then uh, here's our, our formula once again that we're looking for, for the standard deviation in essence of X bar. So here's the sample of three. So the population or the size of the sample is three out of the population, which was only seven in our example, and then is n over n, little n over big N, less than 0.05. Now, the reason we're doing this is to see whether or not we need to be applying the correction factor. This is the correction factor. Normally you don't, because normally n, this big N, the population is quite large, but we're looking at little n is three, that's the sample, over big N, which is only seven, and that's going to be greater than 0.05 or 5%.
and therefore we would have to, in this case, use the correction factor. Now notice I'm usually just stressing this big N, which is the population, because if the population is large, then it's not likely that you're gonna get a little N, a sample that's gonna be very close to the big N, and therefore you're probably gonna be good to drop off the correction factor, right? Because that's the point. You're not gonna have a very large sample compared to that number. Now, a couple things just to keep in mind here, because this can be a little bit confusing because you might say, hey, isn't it good if I get a bigger sample compared to the population? It is good, but for purposes of this calculation, then it's actually, if you get a large, a large enough sample compared to the population, you need the correction factor. So a couple things to keep in mind here with the population size. Uh, note that when we're, when we're thinking about, one, one question is, how large does the population need to be to give us more confidence? And note that that is a little bit deceptive and the analogy there is similar to like the analogy of tasting how salty a can of soup is. All right, if you have one can of soup, you stir it up, you taste it, and you see how salty it is based on how it tastes. If you have a, high, a giant vat of soup that you're gonna feed to an a entire you know, house of, of people or a, an entire hall of people or something like that, then how do you test how salty the soup is? You still just stir it up and you take one teaspoon of the soup to see if it has the right amount of salt. You don't need to down a gallon of soup in order to determine how salty it is. Similarly here, the idea of the sampling of a larger population, a relatively small sample still gives us pretty good security. So it's not like it goes up on a one for one rate, the larger the sample. So we need a large enough sample, but it's not like if we keep on going over a certain point, it would be like us downing a gallon of soup to determine how salty it is. It might, it might not be a lot more helpful past that point. The other question is, how large of a sample do we need to have in order for us to tend towards a bell-shaped curve? Because remember, it's the idea of the combination of all sample sizes that's gonna tend towards the bell-shaped curve, which is what this calculation is basically kind of approximating. And similarly, we need a sample size that is large enough but once we hit the peak of it being large enough, us going beyond that uh, may not help too much in order for us to get to, get to that bell-shaped curve type of shape. And then there's the question of, do I need to use this second bit of the correction factor? In that case, if your sample size is very large compared to the population, which will usually be the fact that the population itself is actually pretty small, because that's the only way you're going to get a sample size usually that's going to be close enough to the population, then you'd have to use this correction factor. Okay, so just to keep those, those kind of different things straight, that's going to be the idea here. So we said that little n over big N is that. So, da, da. so then we got the standard, the STD, standard deviation of the sample uh, estimated formula if we have the STD of uh, the population. And so that's going to be our formula over here. So that's going to be this calculation. So maybe I won't do it with the, it would be, uh, I won't do it with the calculator right here. It's going to be somewhat tedious, but this formula would be the standard deviation. If we plug the numbers into here, the standard deviation of the population that we would apply, uh, that would be the standard deviation of these numbers, the, the standard, D, if we have that, now notice in practice, you might say, well, I wouldn't have the standard deviation of the population possibly. Well, then we might have to substitute what we would have, the standard deviation of the sample, a sample of three is what we would have possibly. We wouldn't have all of the means here. And, and that's what we're looking to get. We're looking to get, in essence, the standard deviation of all of the combinations of samples but we wouldn't actually have that in practice because we wouldn't actually be doing all possible samples. We would have one sample. So if we didn't have the standard deviation of the population, we might be able to replace this with the standard deviation of the sample we have divided by the square root of N. N is, is the sample size, in our case is three. And then because in our case, we had a sample size that is pretty large compared to the population or a population, in other words, it's pretty small. We had to use the correction factor, which would be the square root of 
big N, which is the population of seven, minus little n, which is the sample of three, divided by big N, population of seven, minus one. Again, this would be cut off typically, but because we have such a small population, we have to use it. We used it in our case to calculate here. Here's our calculation uh, in terms of Excel, and that's gonna give us uh, a difference. So notice what we calculated here with the formula is basically the same that we've got with our with our calculation over here. So all if I took the standard deviation of all of these means, I got to this 3493. So we did it kind of longhand here, actually doing all of the means, which you wouldn't do in practice, but that's what we're tending towards with the formula. Then we used the formula calculation and we got to basically the same number, 34928, 34928. So that's gonna give us hopefully some confidence about this formula over here that we're using and hopefully some intuition about it because you can imagine in practice we would only in this example have one sample possibly of three and then we would have to use this formula then to give us the standard deviation of x bar representing all possible combinations of sample size in our case three of the population in our case of seven here instead of actually doing all combinations because we wouldn't have those. All right, so, so, the, so, the, so the mean sample is uh, 989. The, pop, the population sample uh, is the uh, 299. So this is the mean of one sample of three, just to show that the mean of the population of one sample of three in our case, and of all possible, uh, of all possible means all possible combinations will all tend towards the population mean uh, obviously the mean of the sample of three might not be exactly the mean of the population but it's going to tend towards that mean and that's what we would have in practice the mean of all combinations would be exactly the mean of the population uh, but we wouldn't actually have that when we're doing a testing problem but it's good to understand in theory okay so if we were to create then a, a table based on this information, we can have our lower and upper of, of, our, of our table. And this is just to show us uh, some formatting. This is basically a formatting here using text formula. So category between uh, 175 up to, to 200. This is a frequency distribution which is, is taking all of the combinations that are within 175 to 200, 200 up to 225 from our data over here where we're looking at the means. So we're making buckets to list all of these numbers uh, within so we can graph this. So if I go back on over, we're saying, okay, so we, put, we made these buckets. We can do this with a frequency distribution uh, which would be this one, which would just be taking the upper limits. And then the bucket would basically be saying that that we have everything uh, up to 225 and then 225 up to 250. You got to be a little bit careful about these limits, which we'll talk more about in Excel. I believe this goes from 200 up to, but not including 225, 225 up to, but not including 250 and so on. And then this is a spill array function. You can also do this if you set it up this way with an if function. This is a count if. So I wanna say count ifs with two conditions. It has to be greater than this. And notice I have the, the equal sign uh, on this side here. And we get to the same you know, results under these two ways that we can calculate this. And then we can graph that. And what would we expect? It's tending towards a bell-shaped curve now. We're tending towards a bell-shaped curve. So that means that this data, the mean, is tending towards a bell-shaped curve as would be expected by the central limit theorem, which means we might be able to use our normal curve functions to estimate results based on this, which is useful because that helps us to make predictions. So now I can say, okay, this is tending towards a bell-shaped curve let me make an actual bell-shaped curve, which will help me to make, you know, different predictions, right? So now we're going to say, because it's nice and smooth. So to do that, I'm going to say the lower bit is going to be 149 to the upper uh, uh, of 425. What I'm trying to do here is 
say how many X's do I need to graph the curve? Remembering that drawing a picture is useful. And when we talk about DVA, standard deviations, two standard deviations away has about, uh, has about 95 or so percent of the data. If I go four standard deviations away, that should encompass basically like 100% of the data. So that's what I will typically do here. I'm starting at the center point and I'm going at, uh, four standard deviations below it and, and four above it. So if I go over here, I can say, where's my, where's my middle point? My middle point is at the 299 and then my standard deviations is the 34 93. So I'm going to say, okay, that's one standard deviation. If I go four standard deviations, so 299.28 plus four standard deviations, or let's do it this way. Let's go 34.93 times four plus 299.28. That's how high I would have to go to encompass everything to the right. And then to the left, it would be 34.93, one standard deviation times four, four standard deviations minus 299.28. And this is how far we would have to go on the, the left to, to get all of the data in our, in our bell-shaped curve. Did I do that right? Let me see. Yeah, I think it's just rounding that's the difference and I, and it wouldn't be negative because I just did it the other way so it'd be easy to calculate. So there it is. So there's the lower and the upper. And then if we were to take this, we're gonna say, this is gonna be our X. This is gonna be our P of X. So now on the X's, I've just listed out the lower from uh, 149 and then we, we went up to the 429. So I'm not sure if I went all the way to the 429, but that's the idea. So we went all the way up. And then on this one, we have the calculation, which is going to be now our nice norm.dist, which we'll do in Excel. If you want to take a look at this, we have the X and the X is going to be the mean that we calculated. So we have the mean 299.28. If we had the mean of the population, we can use that. If not, we would have to estimate it possibly with the sample. And then we've got the uh, stand, the the mean, the standard deviation argument here is going to be the standard deviation not of the population, not the standard deviation of a sample of three, but rather the standard deviation of all possible combinations of three, which we calculated here, 3493, which is much lower than the standard deviation of the actual population, but which normally we would have to calculate with of course, the formula, because we wouldn't have all possible combinations. So that's going to give us that one. And then we've got the, 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 the where, where was it? That's some, I'm not in the right spot. Hold on. And then we've got the standard deviation, uh, the X mean standard, and then cumulative. It's not going to be cumulative because we're going to be plotting each point here. So there we have our percents. Do, 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 do. And then if I select this whole thing, uh, P of X, and then graph it, we get our our graph over here. Now we're going to practice graphing this thing multiple different times. Remember that I could graph here and then I could graph down here and represent this in terms of the X's. So there's the X's. And then I could also uh, put the Z scores down here. So Z would be representing the standard deviations. The, this point in the middle would be zero at the Z's and then and then we can measure in terms of like two standard deviations from the top to the to tail to tail would be around 95% and so on and so forth. That's why it's useful. Remember that that middle point was the, the mean, just to check that, which we said was do, 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 over here, 299, 299.28. So, do, 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 So, we're going to say 299 or so is that is that middle point. So that's the general idea. So remember that the, the bottom line is the original population might not have a bell-shaped type of distribution. And if it doesn't, we might be able to use the central limit theorem to still use a bell-shaped distribution. But to do that, we're thinking about uh, the, the standard deviation and the mean. The mean will basically be the same or it's tending towards the middle point of the population whether we talk about the population, whether we talk about one sample, or whether we talk about all 
combinations of the mean of the means, but the standard deviation of the population will not be the same. And that's the other key number we have to get to this, this formula that we're looking for. And that's not going to be approximated by the standard that's not going to be approximated by the standard deviation of one sample it's the idea of the standard deviation of all combinations of sample size whatever sample size that happens to be in our case it was three which we actually did here but in practice it would be approximated by the formula which hopefully we have an intuitive understanding of what the formula is and then what it is we're actually graphing when we're when we're making this uh, bell shaped type of curve, not the actual population data, but the idea of the mean of all possible <laughs> combinations of means, which we looked at here, but would be approximating uh, in practice with the help of the formula giving us the standard deviation part of it, whereas the mean is what we would expect the middle part of the population data or sample data, even though the population data itself would not be possibly bell-shaped, right? And here we are looking at bell-shaped because we're looking at like the mean of all of the means of all possible combinations. Okay.